All right. Uh, well, thanks everybody for joining us tonight for another Sci-Fi Explained. Uh, tonight is about the movie Gravity. And um, Chris Hatfield here is going to start us off with a few minute uh, deconstruction of the movie. Um, as you may or may not know, Chris is a um, former Canadian astronaut um, who became famous for his uh, performance of the song. Um, oh, I just dropped the name of it now. Um, that he performed on the International Space Station, a uh, space oddity. Um, if you haven't already seen that, it, uh, it went viral on YouTube several years ago. So if you just type in Chris Hatfield space oddity, he does a fantastic performance of that, playing the guitar himself on the International Space Station and singing which is no small feat. Um, but yeah, let's watch this little uh, uh, kind of intro to the movie here from Chris Hatfield, and then we can um, talk details. Here we go. Uh, imitating art. My name is uh, Chris Hatfield, a uh, colonel in the Air Force, astronaut, flew in space three times, commanded the International Space Station, did two different spacewalks, used to be a test pilot engineer, downhill ski racer, occasional guitar player, and we're here today to look at some scenes from different space movies. This is gravity, and this is the scene where uh, the space shuttle explorer is orbiting the Earth and they're doing repairs on the Hubble telescope and they go through some sort of asteroid debris field. Okay, well that's a nice concept, and the visuals are great, but what happens is so far from reality that that I, I just, I want to turn my head. First off, the satellite goes whizzing by at about, I don't know, maybe 120 miles an hour. The satellites are, are, are going five miles a second, 17 and a half thousand miles an hour. How that thing where you go, you could identify the satellite going by. And then it's like some big dump truck just suddenly put this big pile of rubble just upwind of, of the space shuttle. It suddenly looks like an avalanche in space has poured in front of this shuttle. And they violate the laws of physics when Sandra Bullock, she on the end of the big canon arm, the big robot arm, and, and it's tumbling, and she releases her little straps, and suddenly, whoo, she flies away in a whole new direction, like there was some force on Sandra that wasn't on the arm. Like, how come she has a different gravity than the arm does? And then everybody on the crew, I mean, the dialogue, they're all yelling back to Houston as if somehow Houston's gonna help them right here. Houston, I've lost visual, Dr. Stone. And George Clooney is referring to this other astronaut as Dr. Stone, like they have they haven't really met each other yet. And he's asking permission from somebody, I don't know, to go and help her out of the, I mean, it's not astronaut behavior, it's not logical behavior, it's so execrable from an actual practical demonstration of what uh, what the reality of spaceflight is like. The most experienced astronaut in American history is a woman, it's Peggy Whitson. She's been in space longer than any other American. She commanded the International Space Station twice. She's done 10 spacewalks. She was NASA's chief astronaut. In this movie, Sandra Bullock has only been an astronaut for like uh, less than a year. and. When she's faced with the problem, she's panicking and has no idea what to do. And George Clooney is driving around like some sort of space cowboy as the only person who really knows what's going on. And it's like they met when they were out on this spacewalk. And then it's like he's trying to pick her up during a spacewalk. Prototypes even for your pretty blue eyes. And what is he even doing out there, driving around in his jet pack? I mean, we don't go outside recreationally. It's so different than the actual people that are exploring space, that, that devote their lives to being astronauts, that are actually on the space station right now. The wonderful human role model examples we have of people who are doing these things, I think it set back a little girl's vision of what a woman astronaut could be an entire generation. Sandra Bullock did a great job of portraying this character in the movie, but I, I just think the character that they wrote for her was really disappointing. 
that's what I would have changed. Get the characters right. Get it to represent what astronauts are actually like, and then build the story around that. Don't just make it the perils of Pauline, uh, where she's strapped to the train tracks and she needs George Clooney to magically appear next to her to tell her which book to open to be able to do the right thing. Real astronauts recognize the seriousness of their job, the fact that it's always life or death, and that we're there as the representatives of seven and a half billion people. Everybody's trusting us to be good at this, to have spent decades getting good at this. If you want to know what a spacewalk looks like, there's never been a better movie, though, than Gravity. That opening scene is magnificent for the visual impact and the beauty of the silent turning world and, and uh, the resolution of each of the fine things and the lighting. It's wonderfully good. So it, it gives you the raw emotional sense of a spacewalk. Just don't pay attention to what the astronauts are actually doing. <clears throat> so don't pay attention to what the astronauts are actually doing. Good advice from Chris Hatfield. Um, okay, so he mentioned a lot of things um, that I want to, to share with you tonight. Um, but I wanted to, to start off, now that we've kind of gotten his two cents, um, with uh, the real life scenario of Space Junk, what this whole movie is based off of. Um, there is some reality to all of that. And there's actually some kind of scary facts about all of that. Um, not really to the extent that was portrayed in this movie, um, but there are some parallels. Um, so I thought it's worth um, sharing some of that information with you. Uh, let me see if I can find that link now. Okay, here we go. So the, um, the, the real life um, issue here is called the Kessler syndrome. Um, Kessler was uh, a NASA employee back in the 70s, and he identified um, the potential of there being a cascading effect um, of the accumulation of space junk not over the course of a couple minutes, like is portrayed in this movie, um, but over the course of years and decades. And this is a, a real deal, um, which there are real scientists concerned about. Um, so I wanna show you this three minute movie about what this really is about, um, and then we can chat about that a little bit. Don Kessler is really a pioneer in the space debris world. Uh, he was the one of the first people to recognize the fact that uh, things that we put into space last a long time, that eventually we're going to have a problem if we don't manage that population better. I'm Don Kessler. I'm the former senior scientist for orbital debris research at NASA. Space is a natural resource like no other. The area we use has become polluted with objects by the debris generated when they collide. What's alarming is that the problem will get worse, even if we stop adding stuff. This happens as a result of collisional cascading. Objects collide at very high velocities, creating a large number of fragments that go on to collide with other objects, creating even more fragments, which then collide with more objects and on and on. This phenomena is sometimes referred to as the Kessler syndrome. Don is often referred to as the father of global debris. Uh, in a positive way, not the negative way, <laughs> but he's responsible for better understanding the debris, what it means to space operations. At the beginning of the space program, there was a general attitude that space was a big sky, that you could put anything in it that you wanted and not fill it up. The problem that you quickly run into is because these things are traveling so fast, they run into each other. And as soon as they run into each other, they create a lot of debris. And the rate of collisions will then increase. And as the collisions increase, you make more debris. And those fragments go collide with other things, and you start really making it more difficult and more expensive to operate in space. After convincing NASA that this was an issue, we launched a program of investigating the problems of space junk. 
with the primary goal of researching and developing solutions to keep space a reusable resource. One of my first jobs was to define the natural space environment. And what gave me an advantage over other people in looking at the orbital debris environment is I use those same models that we use to understand the natural environment and apply them for the first time to the satellite environment. Part of what I did was borrow some from kinetic energy equations and the thermodynamic equations of molecules in a box bouncing around. And uh, even though we've got much more sophisticated models today, they all come up with the same answer. The orbital debris problem is a classic tragedy of the commons problem on a global scale. If we don't change the way we operate in space, all this results in an exponentially increasing amount of debris until all objects are reduced to a cloud of orbiting fragments that are capable of destroying any spacecraft that attempts to operate anywhere within that cloud. Sam? Yeah. Why do they call it the Kessler syndrome? You know, that's a good question. I did a search for that and I couldn't find why they actually use syndrome as opposed to effect um, or cascade. Um, process. Maybe, yeah, process. Maybe syndrome sounds a bit more menacing. Um, Phenomenon. I, Phenomena, yeah, I, I couldn't find a good answer for that, but I wondered the same thing. Syndrome seems misplaced. Um, seems like a medical term, but maybe that's the point. Maybe the it China really, syndrome. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe, maybe it was the t it was the time of the China syndrome, and that was the word of the moment. Could be, you know, or, or maybe it was supposed to invoke an idea of space health and how yeah, that yeah, wasn't yeah. being managed well. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to look for Sufi. Go ahead. So here is the, the real task force that exists <coughs> today, the Orbital Debris Program Office, that actually track um, all of the um, pieces of junk out in space. And there are a lot. Um, 500,000 marble-sized debris objects and over a hundred million objects, one millimeter or smaller. Um, so that's a lot of space junk. And nothing bigger? Well, I mean, you could say that every satellite is a piece of space junk. Uh, but these so, they can, when you're in the, when an astronaut is up there, they can see these things whizzing by? Definitely not. So these objects, as um, Chris Hatfield talked about in that little intro video, they're moving yeah. at tens of thousands of miles an hour. You know, yeah. relative to the, the, um, the space station, they could be moving as much as 50,000 miles an hour if they're moving in the opposite direction. Right. So there's no way um, that most of these objects are visible at all to astronauts. Um, I did listen to a really interesting um, recording from Chris Hatfield he actually talks about sitting really still and quiet on the International, Station, International Space Station and actually listening to these little bits hit the side of the station. <laughs> um, so he, he's actually heard them um, fairly frequently, he said. Within a couple of minutes, you can hear several. Hmm. So these are, wow. the, these are the small ones that can't be tracked. There are large ones up there as well. Um, but stuff that's you know much larger in size, you know, a foot across, a meter across, those are actually trackable. But this program is specifically looking at the small little pieces that can't actually be seen. Um, but there are lots of big pieces. Um, one of the stages of the the Saturn rockets from the Apollo program is still floating around out there, as mm -hmm. are um, several other engine stages. Um, from launches, you know, dating back to the 1960s. Um, eventually, their orbits do decay, and they'll burn up in the atmosphere, but not for um, a really long time. What is the range of what's the range of the orbits? This is, is this low Earth orbit? Yeah, this is all low Earth orbit. So it's a range of a number of miles, isn't it? That's right, between about 100 and 200 miles. So. 
it's a hundred miles is a it's a lot range i mean that yeah. seems a little uh that seems a little absurd with the movie, isn't it? The, the, it the, is. Yeah, in every ninety minutes, the same range, or yeah. So, so that stuff would. In, so, so the talk in the movie, they talk about this um, uh, a Russian missile that they use deliberately to blow up one of their satellites. Um, uh-huh. Russia so has a never a spy satellite. Russia has never done that. However, both the Indian government and the Chinese government have. Um, And the U.S. government has also um, in a slightly um, different way. Um, But yeah, there there are three national governments now that have deliberately blown up satellites. Um, Spy satellites, right? Well, their own satellites, decommissioned satellites. No one has deliberately... Um, used a missile to blow up somebody else's satellite. There was a treaty signed called the Stark Treaty. And so yeah, far, it's been followed. Like Tony Stark? No, not Stark. Uh, Start. Oh. Uh-huh. Start. Although I, I, yeah. I wish it was Stark. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be, yeah. Um, uh, so the, anyway, this, the station is at like 250 miles up. Uh, a little or, bit less than that, I think. But yeah, it's... it's um, Around like 150 to 200 miles, I think. Oh, okay. Um, and there was some comment in the beginning of the film that that the uh, shuttle was working on the Hubble, more like at Hubble altitude. Right. Yeah, so yeah. The, the, the altitudes aren't that different. What is different, however, is the inclination. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope and the International Space Station are at totally different inclinations. So there's no way that they would have been able to visually see the International Space Station from where they were working on Hubble. Um, okay. What do you mean by in- inclination? Uh, so it, the, the orbital path. Okay. Um, so the, you can talk about like, so if it was just orbiting around the equator all the time, the inclination yes. would be zero. Uh-huh. Um, okay. If the inclination were 90 degrees, it'd be going straight over the poles every time. Yeah. It does vary a little bit. Um, and this, this station is, is more of um, a, spir- a, a progressive spiral. Yeah, it, it changes. Um, but it's it's frequently over very, very high latitudes, and that was done because the Russian Soyuz spacecraft was the main vehicle up and down to it. So it was basically for the Russians to make it easier for the Soyuz spacecraft to get up and down to the International Space Station. So I think that the average inclination is something like 56 degrees. Huh. Um, so it goes over um, Russia a lot more than it does, for instance, go over the United States. Uh huh. Well, there's a lot more to Russia to go over. But. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, we only but anyways, have three time zones. They have nine. Yeah. So, so that was one thing that's just totally bogus in the movie. There, there would be thousands of miles apart and moving in uh-huh. totally different angles. So there's uh-huh. no way they could have made that quick little journey. You know, a hundred miles. I think they said from yeah. where the, the Hubble. Hubble Space Telescope to where the International Space Station was. Um, yeah. wouldn't have happened, wouldn't have been, yeah. wouldn't have been close. Um, and altitude. That's yeah, the altitude yeah. Would, would have been different as well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, so that was unrealistic. And just the amount of debris, as we talked about, that was depicted um, was unrealistic as well. Um, even from the demolition of um, satellites that have happened by missiles, most of that debris actually ends up falling back into the atmosphere and burning up, especially the small pieces, um, because they have Mm -hmm. a larger surface area to mass ratio. Mm -hmm. However, um, there has been at least one um, catalog collision between satellites up in space. Um, one of the, the U.S. Iridium satellites uh, collided with an old um, decommissioned Russian satellite. Um, I can't remember what year that was. But all of that debris is still up there. 
that stuff didn't come crashing down um, as did all the pieces from the, the missile strikes. Um, so mm -hmm. slightly you know, different trajectories. Mm -hmm. So Wait, look go ahead. Um, when, the, uh, when the Chinese and the Indians and all decide to uh, blow up their satellites with a missile, they are taking into account the debris field they're creating, right? No, definitely not. Um, yeah. It's, it's uh, just a, it's a show of technological prowess. Um, they don't care about the debris. The U.S. actually deliberately um, shot down one of our satellites in a way that would minimize debris. Um, the deal was it was a recently launched satellite um, that had some kind of communication issues and it was known that it was going to burn up in the atmosphere. However, its fuel was highly toxic. And so mm. the decision was made to, um, to try to destroy the satellite before it re-entered Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so totally wow. different rationale mm. behind it. Yeah. When was that? Um, that was done. In 2007. And when, okay, that, that, I remember this as a bit news article, but yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, was it successful? It was. And yep. it wasn't plutonium. No, no, it was a liquid fuel. Um, mm -hmm. It was called, let's see. Um, here we go. Hydra Zinegus. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Hydra Zinegus, maybe. Um, it's a so made up name, it's, as they say. Hydrazine gas. Yeah. Hydrazine gas. Oh, I see. It's two words. Hydrazine yeah. gas. Yeah. Yeah. Hydrazine gas. Yep. Um, but it was just, I think, the year after that, um, that India shot down their satellite. I think that was in 2008. Um, and then um, China did it in, uh, no, that's something else. Oh, here we go. Um, the Chinese did theirs, in, oh, no, it was also 2007. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boys and toys. Yeah, right. Boys and toys. <laughs> um, so uh, this is reminding me of all the junk that has been left on on Mount Everest. Yeah, there are a lot of um, oxygen canisters up at the high base camp that nobody yeah. takes down. Apparently, there was a cleaning mission. Um, yes, yeah. there are uh, several cleaning missions, and uh, they took down a lot of debris. And bodies. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think there, um, the, the debris stuff is really interesting. Um, Chris Hatfield mentioned one of the, the moments where the laws of physics were totally violated when she flies off the Canadian arm of the, yeah. um, the space shuttle with some like unknown force acting on her. Um, and then there's so a she scene. Would, she would have just floated with the arm. That's right, because, nothing would have changed. Speed. That's right, yeah, that, that buckle mm -hmm. wasn't doing anything except keeping her like physically attached. She would have had exactly the same momentum, the same direction, et cetera. Yes. So there's yes. another scene that happens a little while later, um, which is kind of like a key point in the movie when they've arrived at the International Space Station, I'll bring this up and show it to you. Um, they've arrived at the International Space Station, and again, they're moving way too fast to actually land. And uh, they almost, uh, you know, grab a hold of something, but they can't. And then she's just attached to one of the tethers of the parachute. 
from the Soyuz spacecraft. Because it gets wrapped mm -hmm. around her leg. It gets wrapped around her leg, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so at that point, she's moving at the same velocity as everything else on the International Space Station. So she's got um, no momentum with respect to that rope anymore. Mm. But then George Clooney comes flying by his character and she grabs onto him. So he's got some momentum there relative to her. But then they stop, right? Um, yeah. So a couple of seconds later, they actually stop and here they all are connected, and he's telling her that, that she has to um, let go of him, otherwise they're both going to be pulled away. Well, what force is going to pull them away? It was some momentum or gravity force. Well, there's, there's nothing. It's, it's, the same it's, thing as, yeah. it's the same thing as that Canadian arm scene. There's yeah. no force that would cause him to float away. Once they're connected and she's stopped him, their momentum is exactly the same. So all she has to do is just like gently tug on that cord and he would come right to her. And then they both would move right towards the International Space Station once he hit her. Um, he would slow down, she would speed up, and they would come like tug back and forth just as they were mm -hmm. doing before to get there when he was using yeah. that little jetpack. Yeah. Um, so the whole thing with them being separated like this is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah. The yeah. other truly what, ridiculous. What is the? Uh, Go ahead, Stuart. What is the uh, that parachute doing open out there? Yeah, they and never. He says that in the in the. They well, never explain it. They just say that somehow the parachute's been detonated. I think they just needed a way to make the movie an hour longer. <laughs> if they would have got to the International Space Station with the Soyuz capsule intact, it just would have been about a 20 minute journey back down to the Earth. But that would have been way too easy. So they somehow had to destroy the landing capabilities of the Soyuz spacecraft. How the parachute got detonated, I don't know. Maybe something hit it just in the right spot to knock the parachute out. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean that that was kind of Hollywood, I think. Yeah. Um, but I love Sounds the scene. Like there was a lot of Hollywood on this film. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I I think Hatfield, uh, Chris Hatfield, summed it up really nicely um, mm. in that they they didn't portray the characteristics or the behaviors of the astronauts very well. No. They didn't do a Awful. great job with yeah. the the laws of physics. But yeah. the images they portrayed of the International Space Station and the, the space shuttle and the Earth are actually realistic and visually stunning. And so I, I yeah. think yeah. they did do an excellent job with that. The Earth is realistic and the International Space Station, both ex the exterior of it and the interior of it, were, are very close to reality. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably some aspects of being out in space that were very, I suspect, were very realistic, even with, you know, those, with the exception of the laws of physics problem. Yeah, a I lot think, of well, the yeah floating the, around out there. Exactly. Yeah, all and then all hitting the, other objects hard. I never realized that probably does happen, and I didn't never thought about that. Yeah, so you know the International Space Station is moving around at like seventeen thousand miles an hour. So you know whatever velocity you have relative to it um, is you know going to be cause for concern if you're approaching it. <laughs> you have to have some way of slowing down so you get back to its velocity um, before you contact it. And so yeah, a lot of the pushing and pulling they depicted and floating around, I, I think, was pretty good. Um, but a couple of the key scenes are just ridiculous. Um, the other truly ridiculous scene is when Sandra Bullock takes off her spacesuit. Um, so I did some research on this. I wanted to know how long it actually takes to, to put on and take off a spacesuit. Um, turns out that it's a bit more involved than just like popping off your clothes like Sandra Bullock does. Um, so actually I want to show you this. And did she have, did, 
Did she do it in a place that had oxygen and regular air or not? Yeah, well, somehow that, yeah. so, somehow that cabin repressurized in a couple seconds. Um, it would take, it actually it. takes several minutes on the International mm -hmm. Space Station for that to happen. Um, mm -hmm. But she's wearing some, you know, some pretty flattering underwear underneath her um, spacesuit, um, which is just absurd. So I want to show you a little video of um, what astronauts actually have underneath their spacesuits and just how involved the process is in um, putting it on and, and taking it off. Let me find this real quick here. Give me one sec. Here's my movie. Here we go. Okay, we're just gonna watch the first couple minutes of this and I, I think you'll get the idea pretty quickly. Hey, it's Norm from Tesla.com, and I'm here at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston, Texas. So this is where NASA trains astronauts before they can go to space. I'm here with Terry Dunn, you're the training operations manager. And Terry, we're in front of a spacesuit. Right, this is the extravehicular mobility unit, or EMU as we call it. And it's the spacesuit that astronauts wear for spacewalks either the space shuttle back in those days or the space station now. And so this is in use, this is in the design that's been used for decades. Uh, right, it's essentially unchanged for the past 40 years. Now, we've seen what the spacesuit kind of looks like, you know, in photos and videos, but we don't really know what goes underneath and how an astronaut actually puts on the suit. Can you show us the different components of a spacesuit and, and all the various different uh, accessories that they put on? Well, sure, this is really just the outer layer, and it starts with a few things that we have over here. Now on this table, we have the components to go inside of the suit, uh, starting with the diaper. Underwear, in but, space, uh, but it's a diaper. Uh, right, and uh, it's big enough for an adult, but it's the <laughs> same purpose. And it, ideally, you're not gonna have to use it, but in reality, you're gonna be in that suit about six hours, so. And this is only worn when you're in, going to wear a space suit. Uh, right. And not and, when you're just floating around the ISS. <laughs> Up to them. <laughs> right. Personal preference, I suppose. But when you got to go, you got to go. Now, over the diaper, you're going to have basically off the shelf cotton long johns. All right. So, uh, it'll and be cotton's a, fine? Uh, right. And the idea is that it's going to wick away any sweat that you have in there so that your body doesn't get slippery uh, mm -hmm. and you're not going to puddle sweat at the bottom of the suit. So, you would have the pants and then also a long sleeve shirt that would go over that. Sounds good. Sounds like everything I could buy at a supermarket right now. Right. So far, you're good. <laughs> yeah. You're ready to go into space. Next, you're going to get derailed a little bit. Uh, this is the liquid cooled ventilation garment. And basically, it's a, a jumpsuit with very stretchy material. But woven in through that material are tubes that uh, run okay. cold water. So, by varying the flow rate of that cold water, you can manage your body temperature. You can imagine with all this stuff underneath and then all the stuff you're going to put on the outside, you get hot very quickly, especially if you're working outside. And so, it's just through these tubes here, and, and it's designed so those are the points where heat can be can be released more effectively. Right. It's distributed well enough right. that you don't feel point cooling. It's basically an overall effect. Okay. And then um, we've got the communication cap, and this is really kind of a NASA trademark. This is the Snoopy cap that yeah, you've yeah. read about forever. And I'll just stop it right there. Um, you get the idea with the diaper and the, uh, the cooling suit. Not exactly sexy underwear. Is it 100% cotton, Sam? Uh, the the ventilation suit is not. It's all synthetic, but apparently no, but they I mean, do they do wear cotton underwear. underwear. Yeah. Cotton seems yeah, like it, the last thing you would choose. But you, but it would absorb it rather than wick it away to to puddle. So yeah, and that's that's exactly what they anyway. want. Yeah. yeah, they want they want the absorbent qualities of cotton. This huh. the space suits were made were made uh, where we lived in Connecticut at Hamilton Standard. Oh, nice. Near the airport there was the um, Hamilton Standard factory. So they designed them and made them. This next video I want to show you is a one minute time lapse of putting on a spacesuit. Uh, so it turns out it takes about 45 minutes for a whole team of people to help an astronaut put on a spacesuit. Um, and it takes over 25 minutes on average to get it off. 
um, with a team helping you. Um, so the fact that Sandra Bullock whips off her spacesuit um, in just under a minute is, um, is pretty impressive. But here's well, the she real- had to under, She had to in the ocean. <laughs> that's right. And yeah, and that's like the other ridiculous part. Not gonna happen. Um, she definitely would have drowned at that point. Um, look, just watch this. This is pretty cool. And you can kind of see the, the whole thing in just under a minute here. Um, she's already got the ventilation system on, but she's just going to be putting on the, um, the outer layer here. So yeah, so one minute in time lapse just to put on the outer suit. Um, well, let's go to this scene where Sandra Bullock um, tears it all off in under a minute when she first gets back to the International Space Station here. Here we go. Done, do you think, in the hyperbolic plane, or was it all digital? And it was all digital, yeah, and land based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> One thing they got right was the Snoopy cap. <laughs> Are you there? Yeah, forgot to uh. unmute myself. Um, so apparently uh, astronauts are also just dripping in sweat. Um, when they get out of their spacesuits. Um, and you can kind of see she looks bone dry, um, mm. which is also just, just ridiculous. Um, apparently there's a, a word that gets used for taking the spacesuits off, um, similar to how medical professionals talk about taking off their, um, their personal protection equipment. It's called uh, doffing a spacesuit. Um, and even under like emergency protocol to get somebody out quick, um, it can be done in like 15 or 20 minutes. It usually takes longer than that with all the depressurization that's necessary and then just the time it takes to get things off. So, and it's a team of people that's needed. Apparently the dexterity you have in those um, space gloves is um, incredibly limited. Um, mm. So let alone yeah. like taking off your own spacesuit grabbing onto anything, moving at any velocity is nearly impossible. So those scenes where they're like whizzing by the International Space Station trying to grab onto something, there's no way they could have actually grabbed onto anything. Um, <laughs> those big space gloves. Um, apparently it's, it's incredibly difficult uh, to grab anything. And then it's the reverse, uh, needing lots of help to put the suits on when they're going for an EVA. Wait, say that again? So they need lots of help 
from one another to put on the suits again. Oh um, yeah. If, if when they're going out for a walk. Oh yeah. Yeah. It takes 45 minutes to get totally suited up um, with a team of people helping you on the international space station. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All yeah. right. Um, let's see here. There are a couple other things I wanted to show you. How about the fire? The fire interested me. Yeah, so inside the International Space Station, there can be fire because there's oxygen. Mm. So that's legitimate. Um, it seems to spread pretty quickly. Um, but isn't fire funny, funny shaped in space? Yeah, um, so it, you know, it, it moves differently. Um, yeah. And I don't know the, the details with that. Um, the other um, interesting thing that got depicted um, was uh, at some point you see her, I think it's in the Soyuz capsule maybe, and she's sweating. Um, or you can see like perspiration on her face. Yeah. Um, but and, also it's cold and there's frost on the windows and you can see her breath like on a cold day. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, that's tricky, right? So, so if you're, why is that? You're like, breathing the air out, control? so there's like velocity yeah. from your breath, um, right. but it doesn't move in the same way because it's near zero gravity. And so right. I think uh -huh. they, they portrayed that in a, a slightly strange way, um, but, I, but what, I couldn't confirm that. I looked for some information about that and, and couldn't find it. But wouldn't it be also temperature controlled that there wouldn't be frost on the windows and, you know, the way it's depicted. Yeah, I mean, I think the assumption is that she's got everything turned off to save energy. Oh. So she's oh. not running oh. the heater, but yeah, oh. I think they probably are climate controlled to some extent. Yeah. Um. So you, were, you were saying, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, I wanted to show you um, some interesting stuff about how water actually moves in space. Mm -hmm. um, the sweat on astronauts doesn't behave in the same way. And I've got a great video here, if I can find it, of um, what it looks like when you actually uh, tear in space. Um, there's actually water um, moving on your face. So here's Chris Atfield again, actually doing a demonstration on the International Space Station. It shows how um, water pools on your face in, um, in near zero gravity. So here's a common question. Can you cry in space? Do tears work? Well, let's try it out. I can't cry on command, but I'm going to take some water, drinking water, put it in my eye just as if I was crying. Let's see what happens. Get myself nice and stable for you here. Here we go. So just as if I started crying, my eye is full of tears. But you can see it just forms a ball on my eye. In fact, I can put more water in. Uh -huh. well, if you keep crying, you just end up with a bigger and bigger ball of water in your eye. Until eventually it crosses across your nose and gets into your other eye, or evaporates, or maybe spreads over your cheek, or you grab a towel and dry it up. So yes, I've gotten things in my eye. Your eyes will definitely cry in space, but the big difference is tears don't fall. So grab a hanky. Um, That's cute. Yes, I think there's actually a scene where Sandra Bullock is like crying. And yes. You can yes. almost see the tears yeah. running down her face. Um, yes. That would not happen. Um, they would just pull on her eyes just like that. Um, Chris Hatfield has this amazing story about when he went blind in space. Um, what happened was that the anti-fogging chemicals that are on the um, inside the helmets that astronauts wear, somehow a little bit of that got into his eye and it started tearing. And he, you, know, you can't actually like, you know, touch your eye when you got a big helmet on when you're doing a spacewalk. And so we just kept tearing and tearing and tearing. And eventually the water went across his nose into his other eye until he couldn't see anything. 
and so he had to maneuver back into the um, the space station, basically blind. Um, he was tethered, um, but he had to find his way um, without being able to see. And so he does a wonderful TED talk about that. Um, mm. And so there's a there's a scene early on in the movie where she's breathing, Sandra Bullock's breathing really heavily, and her face mask starts fogging up. Um, yes. My guess is that wouldn't have happened because of the anti-fogging chemicals that are on the inside of the helmets. Um, so I think that was done for dramatic effect as well. She, she, mm. they, they did that, I think, to show how anxious she was. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, and Chris Hatfield pointed out that even in emergencies, um, astronauts tend to keep their cool. That's not what an astronaut does. They think of plan B. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the big point that Chris Hatfield makes, that you just, you problem solve, problem solve, problem solve. Yeah. Plan B, plan C, plan D. Exactly. I'm um, just checking my notes here to see if there's anything else I wanted to <laughs> show you. Oh, so, uh, so at the beginning, um, he's... Uh, uh, George Clooney's character is flying around in that um, that jetpack. Matthew Kowalski. Thank you. Yeah. Wasting fuel. Yeah, wasting fuel ridiculously. So, so Chris Hatfield pointed out that little interview that no one would ever be doing that. But it turns out that all astronauts are equipped with a little small jetpack. It's called SAFER. That's the uh, the acronym. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, it stands for the um, Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. Um, EVA is um, extra vehicular activity. So when you're outside the International Space Station or outside the space shuttles. And so they do have these little jetpacks um, that they can maneuver around, but only in an emergency if they somehow get severed from their tether. Um, they can use uh, a small amount of proportion, uh, propulsion uh, to get back um, towards the International Space Station, um, but nothing like the uh, the MMU, the man maneuvering unit that um, that the character was using um, in the film. And then that whole scene with like her flying around with the fire extinguisher, using that yeah. as a yeah, about as ridiculous in the movie The Martian when he punctures his. Uh, spacesuit on his thumb and uses that as propulsion. I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Interesting. So that, that was all the different stuff I want to show you. What, um, what questions or curiosities um, do you have? Uh, either stuff that we've already talked about or, or haven't talked about yet. Um, what was the chance that she was going to survive after she landed on that desert island in the middle, <laughs> that isolated island in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, right. So you're, you're led to believe that at that point, uh, she's within range of um, radio tower communications because NASA contacts her, tells her uh, that they're on their way to rescue her. Oh, um, I, didn't, I missed that. Was that? Yeah, it happens really briefly just as she hits the water. Um, as the thing's filling up with water, she gets a, a short communication. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, so NASA's on their way, but she sinks to the bottom of that lagoon. And there's no way that she's going to get her spacesuit off in time um, before she drowns. Um, so that was, yeah, just an impossibility. Um, it would not have happened. Um, and, and typically, <laughs> astronauts do wear full spacesuits um, when they're in the Soyuz craft. Um, just like the same type of spacesuit that they're wearing when they do um, spacewalks outside. What the about the realistic and unrealisticness of that whole last scene where she entered the atmosphere? And the re-entry. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> she would have. She would have burned up. Um, there is an incredibly precise way that those spacecraft have to enter the atmosphere. They have to be at the perfect angle, not too steep, not too shallow. Um, otherwise, they either skip off the atmosphere or they burn up. So the fact that so she was somehow able to like eject herself as she was burning up in the atmosphere was just ludicrous. Um, there's no way that would have worked. She would have been toast. 
Um, the Goldilocks angle. Yeah, right. <laughs> Interestingly enough, so this movie was made in um, 2013. At the time, there really was a Chinese space station up there. Um, but in 2016, it malfunctioned and actually burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. Oh. Um, so there currently isn't a Chinese space station, but there was. Uh, they, uh, were there, did they portray it correctly? You know, I, my guess is it would have um, been similar. I mean, it would have broken up like that. I don't know about all that shimmying they, uh, they showed. Um, I guess you're led to believe that, you know, that somehow friction is increasing as it gets deeper into the atmosphere. And so um, it starts shimmying. And I, I guess that's, you know, probably similar. I've seen simulations in like wind tunnels of spacecraft and um, they do shimmy around a little bit like that. So, yeah, I assume. What about, so. what about the fact that, um, I mean, when the Chinese station blew up, um, were there no survivors or were there survivors or no people around? There was nobody on it. Oh, lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I can find that little video. Um, well, there were no, there were dead people on the shuttle. Right. Oh yeah. In the movie. The stage, in the movie. But not, no people on the state, the ISS at, or on the Chinese right. station. So the idea is that they all escaped in the other pod. Um, so that. Oh, I see. Yeah, so there, there were people on the ISS, probably not many, right? Because um, it looked like there was a full crew on the space shuttle. And so you're led to believe yeah. that a lot of the crew was on the space shuttle, they all died. Oh, and whatever remaining yeah. crew was on the International Space Station, um, they escaped in the other Soyuz craft that wasn't there anymore. Uh -huh. And the Chinese craft was empty also. And it was empty, yeah. They had already escaped in the other, uh, <clears throat> their um, escape module, yeah. What struck me was that the control panels were portrayed as identical, though, with Russian or Chinese writing on them. Well, the, apparently the writing was in Chinese, but all the buttons were in the same place. Exactly. Yes, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, would make I, sense in case you had to uh, do what yeah, you did. I, I did a little research on that, and it, it seems like no astronaut would be able to do that unless they were trained. Um, <clears throat> yeah. so the fact that she's just playing like eeny, meeny, my mo, pushing butts, buttons and hoping that it's going to work um, is a yeah. bit outlandish. Kind of like yeah. reminds me of that scene in, the, term in uh, the Matrix where, you know, Trinity or whatever needed to fly a helicopter. And they yes. Knowledge <laughs> into her head. It's exactly. something like that. <laughs> um, so let's let's watch this little two-minute video here of the real um, Chinese space station um, crashing down. I think it's just a simulation, but I'll give you an idea of, um, of how big it was and what happened. This is, this is the one they portrayed as as big as a school bus. Yeah, and it is that big. Yeah. And there we are. Yeah. So that's about the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope is about the size of the school bus. Mm -hmm. So this thing was just at the beginning stages of being built. And I think the plan was to um, uh, keep it up there longer, but. The, the other thing, when it was uh, breaking up and, sh and she had jettisoned her capsule, there were um, you know, multiple fragments, huge, uh, and but one of them went whizzing by the others. Right. Yeah, that seems a little bizarre. They all would have been moving at basically the same velocity. There would have been drag at that point, so potentially some pieces had more drag than others. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, hard to say. That was a bit. Yeah. So this is a little bit less dramatic than what was in the movie. It's plenty dramatic. Sorry, I forgot the sound. There. Um, 
So here's the actual fireball that it made. And they pretty much controlled where it came down, right? No, no, it, it no? Um, so this is, this is actually a re-entry of another spacecraft earlier, but no, it, yeah. it came down um, uncontrolled. Uh, just like the Challenger? No. Well, so I mean, the Challenger never made it into orbit. Um, right. This was in orbit. The Columbia you're talking about. Yeah, Columbia. So it was just good fortune that it landed in the Pacific and not in Las Vegas. That's right. But yeah, I mean, there is this spectacular breakup of, you know, bits and pieces. Yeah. So not that dissimilar from what they showed in the movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other comments, questions, curiosities? Um, we won't watch it now, um, mm -hmm. but I do want to show you another uh, little video that I found, which does a fantastic job in describing um, the truth about space debris. Um, so if you're interested, I can send you this film. It's really well done. Yeah. And they, yeah, yeah. Um, they go through all of the details about um, the actual space junk that's up there, the actual missile launches that destroyed satellites, and then the, the two or three different ideas that NASA and other agencies have of actually um, collecting space debris. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, are they? Um, they're, they're interesting. None of them are really viable economically, and that's the problem right now. Um, Got it. But yeah, near the end of this video, I think it, um, yeah, once you get to like minute 13 or 14, it starts showing you the, um, some of the ideas of removing space junk. Um, so I'll and send then, you the link. I'll go if ahead. If you buy a little bracelet, all the money for the cost of the bracelet goes towards the project of collecting the garbage out of the space um, debris project. Mm. I like oh. the idea. Yeah, it's like, like it's like plastics in the ocean. Yeah, for yeah. ocean. <laughs> There's another one now about uh, some other debris collection fundraising idea that has a bracelet. So nice. when I watch the space station go overhead on the rare coincidental clear night, Sometimes it seems like it has not a straight path, but a jaggedy path. And my conjecture has been that it's dodging debris. Um, it shouldn't be jaggedy. Um, it's definitely I mean, a straight path. Go ahead. It, you know, it, it varies, as you were saying, it, it varies its orbit and during every orbit. Um, right, right. And it's obviously curved because it's going around the earth. Right. Um, the, the space station can be maneuvered um, around debris, um, but there's no way that would be perceptible from the ground. I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, a few hundred meters um, up to a kilometer, and yeah, the, yeah, we wouldn't be able like, to detect that unless you were watching it in a telescope. Yeah, no. Is this, uh, could it be a light, uh, a light distortion? Um, um, well, the, the it, brightness it, definitely changes as you watch it, as different yeah. um, solar panels reflect light down. Yeah, <clears throat> no, 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 it's, um, and it's, it's more, uh, I see it higher up where it isn't the distortion near the horizons. Um, and it looks like it's more than 50 meters, you know, considering the distance, you know. Um, hmm. I'll have to watch for that. I've never seen anything like that. Um, I don't. I don't think um, any deviation would be visible from the ground. But maybe I'm wrong. I'll I'll look into that and see if it's possible. Um, That's right. It does get it does get maneuvered around space junk. I was reading about that earlier. Oh. Uh, uh. 
that's why I was thinking it might be light distortion because sometimes that's the illusion you get watching stars. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen the brightness change dramatically. Uh, oh, yes. Over the course of a couple seconds. Yes. Yeah. Depends upon which way the panels are facing and where the sun is. But um, no, no, this is different from that. Um, and I've seen it, 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 you know, I think I've seen it a number of times. Let me, let me make it relativistic phrase statement. I wonder how common it is to maneuver it around space generators. What's that? Yeah. I wonder how frequent they would maneuver it mm. around space it's a, great, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'll see if I can find that as well. So it, okay. They could do slalom courses. <laughs> well, in essence. I think eventually I they might have to. Um, well, I'll, uh, I'll send this link out um, to all of you in a few moments. Um, I appreciate you joining me for another edition of Sci-Fi Explained. Um, wonderful, thank you. Yeah, wonderful. You're welcome. Glad thank you're enjoying it. And um, yeah, oh, I yeah. haven't picked out the next movie yet, but um, once I do, I'll let you know. Sounds great. Great. All right. Well, have a wonderful. Hooked, Stuart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have a uh, have a lovely evening, and I will see you all sometime soon. Thank yes, you. thank yes. you. Oh, thank you, Sam. So, Take Sam, care. so you had mentioned that there's going to be additional speaker series through yeah. some the next several months or we've got at least one person lined up for June and another person <laughs> lined up for July. Um, okay. the person from June is one of the directors of Idaho National Laboratories. Oh, cool. I think she's ah. going to be fantastic. I can't remember yeah. uh, her name is um Kelly Lively, um, and I'll get her information up soon. And yeah. then the other person for July, um, I can't remember his name right now, um, yeah. but he does aerospace stuff. So we have a next door neighbor from South Carolina who has a mm. good friend that's a former astronaut. Mm. Uh, Stuart, oh. do you remember his name? No. It's like hooch or something like that. 